uh, the initial few uh, minutes, I would try to sort of update you on um, various aspects, but uh, then I will go more uh, onto the fluid therapy and what I'm talking about as updates on fluid therapy and also introduction of uh, what you, some of you may know as what's. So what I'm actually trying to say is uh, what, I've, what I've experienced continuously for the past uh, 10 years, uh, almost every day uh, in managing a large number of dengue patients of all ages. And this is not a systematic review or collection of findings from experience of others. There is solid documented evidence available at the Center for Clinical Management of Dengue uh, about what I'm going to say. So this may be different to what you uh, read from literature. Now, these are some new concepts that I want to drive in so that give, show you a, a way out so that you will have, feel, uh, uh, feel better in handling uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever patients, the most important part of dengue, which I will be talking about. Now, this is our, our Center for Clinical Management of Dengue in Nigambo, which Dimitri uh, just described. We have 23 beds where we have patients of all ages. Since July 2013, this was started. We have managed 11,533 patients. And in our hospital, which is uh, which attracts a lot of dengue patients, there were times in 2017 where we had even as much as 700 patients on a given day. Um, we have, uh, we used to get down the, the most uh, important or the most uh, unstable patients with dengue to our unit or depending on that time. During a time of uh, uh, severe epidemic, probably we are full of uh, all the bad patients, but in, in during times that we are we have less dengue we probably have uh, patients who are uh, less unstable also in our uh, center so but out of all these patients uh, whom we have admitted 11533 we had uh, we had only uh, about uh, we had only about uh, less than 30 patients whom we had to oh, admit to intensive care or ventilation, which is less than 0.3%. This is uh, that, and the age range has been from six years to 92 years. And uh, if you look at this, uh, this graph, this shows uh, our uh, Dengue case load and the case fatality rates in Sri Lanka from 1989. I did the internship in 1989, and that was a time where we had 200 patients and 20 deaths in Sri Lanka. And then, um, we, you, as you can see, the number of cases have gone up. The highest was 186,000 in 2017. But our case fatality rate has gradually come down from uh, 9 to uh, about 0.1. This is the last update that I got today, about 20 uh, and 21. You see, uh, this is the story for most countries where when they, when they had to sort of um, face dengue as a new disease, there was a learning curve. When Thailand had a 13% case fatality rate in 1958, which was down to 0.4 in 1989, at the same time we had almost 10% case fatality in that, that same year. But now we have almost come a uh, hundredfold uh, less in our case fatality, not the case numbers. That is because we improved on learned on clinical management. All uh, what I say is that this is not enough. We need to improve more. So my presentation and all what I'm going to say is based on uh, on what I would like, what things I propose to happen so that we could uh, get a case fatality rate of less than 0.1%. This is the dengue classification in 1975. Uh, if you see uh, a large part of dengue viral infections were asymptomatic, then you had uh, the symptomatic patients with dengue fever and dengue hemorrhagic fever. The dengue hemorrhagic fever also the largely, um, the main difference was the plasma leakage and or the patients with the leaking syndrome. 
and the ones who leaked less and were grade one and grade two, and the ones who had hemodynamic instability or shock or impending shock were considered grade three and grade four. And then uh, there are there are these there's another classification came in 2009. The first classification that Sri Lanka follows now is uh, what he started in 1975 and by 1997 it was um, further modified uh, and in 2011 there was a WHO0 guideline that uh, improved a little bit more on that basis right um, 2009 there was a, the, another guideline introduced by the WHO TDR group called probable dengue dengue with warning signs and severe dengue um, which thought that dengue is one disease entity. The difference between the, the previous classification was that we, that DFDH were considered as two different entities, though it is one, one disease. Sri Lanka adopted only that. This is the, the other classification, which I'm not going to talk about. And inside this classification, there are some patients whom we cannot really fit in. They are considered as the atypical dengue or expanded dengue syndrome, which may be sometimes due to the virus uh, acting atypically, or maybe it is it is due to many other factors like host factors, or maybe there are associated comorbidities, or they may be just completely some other disease uh, causing co-infections. So these are the the, the, grade, the four grades of uh, dengue, as I said. And um, one of the things that we have found is that 95% of all dengue deaths are inside this uh, relatively small category called dengue hemorrhagic fever, or the ones who, who has leaking. This is the, the main, the natural history that you have a febrile phase you have, which goes on for two to seven days. And then you have a period of 24 to 48 hours, or could be less, but it is hardly more than 48 hours where the patient will uh, start uh, leaking uh, fluid out of the vascular compartment in, in, in selective places. And then the, um, after 48 hours uh, or less, uh, the leaking, once the leaking phase is over, the fluid start uh, reabsorbing and then the patient enter into a convalescent phase. If you are a DF patient or the dengue fever patient, who you will have no leaking phase. So that's the difference. Most of the first timers of uh, dengue are, um, are DF, not all. And the second time, when you get still, most of the patients are DF, but most of the dengue hemorrhagic fever patients are patients who have developed it for the second time or more times. You can develop dengue four times during lifetime, and each time they get uh, infected with one type, you have lifelong immunity against that, and cross immunity against the other three for a few months ranging from maybe six months to even one year sometimes. But later on, then you can develop uh, develop uh, dengue again due to another serotype. Now, the large majority of dengue deaths are inside DHF. And therefore, managing DHF better is the best way to reduce dengue mortality. One thing you need to remember is DHF is not badly managed DF. But Dengue shock syndrome or dengue, uh, or is or what is known as grade three and grade four is often uh, badly managed grade one and grade two. This is a, the case of uh, a, dengue, a, a patient with dengue fever whom I personally knew. His platelet count was down to uh, 2000. He was uh, not careful. He was exerting himself a lot while having uh, Having, having dengue, and when his counts came down to 2000, somebody attempted giving him a platelet transfusion for which he developed a reaction. So he got a cardiac arrest, uh, anaphylaxis, and he had to be, be ventilated for 36 hours. I took this picture about 12 hours after he was taken off the ventilator, but see, he's, he's still well because he's DF. This, if this happened to a leaking patient, he would have, he would have lost him. So that's the difference between between uh, dengue fever and dengue hemorrhagic fever. Occasionally, dengue fever can be uh, severe, where you can have a massive bleeding. Most of the time, when these kind of things, when this kind of bleeding happens, either you have a, have a bleeding ulcer or something, or you have somebody has given the patients NSAIDs. 
right? Uh, the most important thing in dengue hemorrhagic fever that we uh, we are taking into account to manage is that the in in the fluid leaking is selective to the pleural and peritoneal cavities. There is gradual accumulation of fluid in these spaces, and we 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 can do limited ultrasound, look at the chest and abdomen, and then diagnose objectively whether the patient is having DF or DHF. This is uh, probably in the in the world where we want to bring down our case fertility from 0.1 to further down. The best way to diagnose uh, DHF is uh, using ultrasound, serial ultrasounds. So this is this is this was added uh, unofficial to our our uh, guidelines. Our last guideline was 2012, but we we started uh, doing. Um, ultrasound scanning for dengue in a routine fashion in 2012. Our center was uh, the one that had introduced it to, it to the routine management. Of course, when we, when we first introduced it, people thought it is not practical to do ultrasound in all patients. But the 2017 dengue epidemic proved it is not the case. This is an example of a, of a uh, young, uh, just uh, resident house officer, just one year after internship, learning uh, after having learned uh, bedside ultrasound scanning, doing a scanning to detect whether the patient is DF or DHF. This is the large dengue epidemic we had in 2017, where we had just a uh, 50 bedded uh, ward having 250 patients. That's the, that's the male ward, and this was the female ward of our hospital. And this is the children's ward where active leakers, three active leakers had to share one bed. But still, we managed to do uh, the, 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 in the eligible patients whose, whose um, platelet count was low, uh, where we had to look for a leaking. I'm going to tell about it uh, soon. Uh, we managed to do ultrasound scanning of all those patients who were admitted to our, our ward with, uh, with suspected leaking during that. So it is not impossible. It is, it is something possible. We did so even well before we published um, our 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 findings on uh, ultrasound. And this is the classical uh, ultrasound um, investigation form that we designed for this, which is now nationally accepted, where we look for fluid in the peri infused places, pericholicystic fluid, um, pericholicystic thickening, fluid in the Morrison's pouch, fluid in the pelvis, and pleural effusions on, on uh, either side, right side and left side. So that's all you need to do. This will not take more than five to seven minutes the most. What about pericardial effusions? Possibly pericardial effusions were, were not noticed by us and I think it is, it is not part of natural leaking in, in large number of patients. It is due to fluid overload. Now, when should we do ultrasound? We found that out of uh, 500 random sample of DHF patients in 2017, there was just one patient who leaked at a platelet count uh, around 200,000. Three patients who leaked between the platelet counts of 120 to 100,000. And 99, more than 99% of the patients uh, started leaking when their platelet counts were less than 100,000. So the first ultrasound should be done. And the first opportunity uh, of the platelets coming down below 100,000, maybe you can start, do it when the counts are less than 150,000, by the time the patient come to you, the patient has already uh, had the count few hours before, maybe the current count is less. This is an observation which was, which is, uh, which was uh, written by Professor Suchitra Nimnetya as well as Professor Halstead um, back in 1997, that the, that the leaking starts as uh, in that is included in the classification that in the in the definition of DHF that the platelet count has to be has to be less than hundred thousand, which is true even even today. So the so most patients, if you have a patient whose play, whose platelet count is um, less than hundred thousand or coming towards uh, hundred thousand, we should do an ultrasound to see whether the patient has started leaking, even though the patient does not have any warning signs, even though the patient is completely. Uh, stable. Uh, when you see they are, do an ultrasound, 
if you if you find uh, fluid, then you will have to repeat the ultrasound to see whether there is gradual accumulation. If there is, if this ultrasound is negative, it doesn't show any fluid. There are two possibilities. One is it is a DF patient who is not going to leak, or it is a DHF who has not started leaking yet. Now, once we diagnose that the patient is leaking, especially after seeing more than one ultrasound showing that there is there's leaking, then we need to we need to uh, manage this patient with the fluid regime, which I'm going to talk about. And um, for that, we need the hematocrit because we only found that, that there's the onset with the ultrasound. Now we need to use the hematocrit, bulb pressure, pulse pressure, urine output, heart rate, uh, for the rest of our management. So once the dengue hemorrhagic fever is identified, once we know this patient is leaking, some patients will leak slowly, others will leak fast. Avoiding shock is is the avoiding the first shock is easy. When you when it is um, to avoid first shock uh, or even even uh, re shock, we need to do some monitoring and monitoring of key parameters. Out of all these parameters, I think the most important parameter is pulse pressure. And what I recommend is to keep the pulse pressure uh, at 30 millimeters, uh, more than 30 millimeters uh, mercury. That's your difference between the systolic and the diastolic. This is, these are sort of random pictures of the monitor that I've taken in my unit. You can see the blood pressures, the figures are different, but still you will see in all these patients with a, that there's a, the, whatever the age, even from a neonate up to an, an old um, uh, person, the pulse pressure, the normal pulse pressure will remain more than 30. And, and look at this uh, young uh, man's uh, monitor, where the systolic is only 86 and diastolic is 42, the mean arterial pressure is 55. This is not a patient who will need uh, inotropes. This patient is very stable. The heart rate is normal. This pulse pressure is more than 30. You don't have to do anything. The same here also. So the pulse pressure is the most important parameter. Occasionally, there may be people whose, whose pulse pressure is less than 30, maybe 27, 28, or 26. But this is very, very, very small percentage of patients. In my experience, it is only less than 0.5%. Now, how much fluid to give? If you look at the fluids, there are various different fluid regimes in the world. And traditionally, most of these fluid regimes use fluid rates of 3 to 10 ml per kg per hour, with most baseline fluids averaging around 3 ml per kg per hour. Here are some examples from different countries. This is from Bangkok. This is our own, our own uh, guideline. Uh, then this is uh, the WHO TDR guideline. This is uh, again 2012 TDR guideline. They all say to use fluids at 5 to 10 ml, 3 to 5 ml, 2 to 3 ml, and so on, or, or 7, 5 to 7 ml, 3 to 5 ml per kg for a few hours, and, and so on. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the standard that is used world over. And um, I, my, my dengue, what I'm talking about, the management that we are, we are adopting in our center is mainly based on the on the basis, the core cool knowledge that I acquired from Thailand, from Professor Sujitra Nimanetya, who has, who has spent decades of her uh, life in, with, uh, in, in bedside. I mean, in my case also that I, I'm telling you that I, this 11,533 patients that are in our unit, I have seen each one of them more than, more than uh, once, almost everybody more than once a day during their stay during the last 10 years. Um, the last uh, seven years. So this is uh, the, the fluid quota that we are talking about and the way to calculate what is called M plus five. Um, and uh, initially, before, before this was introduced, uh, I can, uh, before this was introduced, uh, this, the previous fluid regime was maintenance into two. The whole thing is that the assuming that the leaking is for 48 hours to give one day's fluid into on, to, on, on two days. So that's that's kind of maintenance into two was then they found that there is more fluid overload with that. And then this 
this new regime was found and we have we have found it to be very very, very useful and this is also used in various other countries the m plus 5 fluid regime and this is the the standard uh, fluid fluid chart that we have fluid uh, chart that we have in our national guidelines where a patient will uh, have maximum leaking around 24 hours if the patient is leaking for leaking for 48 hours and then if they come if we are is leaking and the patient comes in shock probably we assume that the patient has leaked for 24 hours and then the patient can uh, has to be given the balance the entire fluid within the next uh, 24 hours what about the duration of leaking the duration of leaking, leaking is it's it will almost never exceed 48 hours this is our experience after many years of being at the bedside and some patients will leak for less than 24, less than 48 hours. Sometimes it is just uh, 24 hours. If so, the amount of fluid that you need is not the total fluid quota. And it is mostly mostly less. It is it is probably proportionately less. It is not M plus five. So as a result, if a patient leaks for 24 hours, you might uh, you can still get fluid overloaded without exceeding your Exceeding your fluid quota because you might, if you are leaking for 24 hours, the, the entire fluid that you might need is need maybe half of M plus five. If you give more, give more than half of M plus five for a patient who leaks more than 24 hours, you have already overloaded that patient. One of the key things that I that one that you should uh, we observe with dengue is that unlike many other epidemics. In Sri Lanka, we had uh, in 2017 almost 400 uh, deaths for nearly uh, 200,000 patients. And uh, compared to most other epidemics, there are hardly any home deaths with dengue, or home deaths are very much less. And what is the reason? Do some people die because they come to hospital, or has the body got uh, its compensatory mechanisms that is minimizing leaking if if they are not uh, intervened with fluids? So that's that's the question that we have. So when you are treating the patients with fluids, one other thing that we need to think is we should support the body's own um, mechanisms of pay, keeping the patient stable against leaking rather than working against it. What I propose to give is to use this uh, this fluid regime of 1.5 ml or 25-50 regime for an adult patient. We would think that an adult, all adult patients are considered to be, say, having uh, 50 kilograms in weight or more. Even for them, the the fluid regime that we can use is use is uh, to give it, considering that their weight is uh, 50. Yeah, of course, there can be adoption uh, chance for uh, patients who are tall and uh, have uh, high uh, weights. I'm not going to talk about it due to lack of time. So what, one of the, the things that we can do is we, we should uh, give a child 0.5 ml IV, which is to keep the vein open, and give 1 ml oral fluids for an adult that you will give the patient uh, 25 ml uh, IV and 50 ml oral. I'm, I'm again telling that there are patients who, whom you may be able to manage with oral fluids completely, but we are looking at bringing down the national uh, case fatality rate less than 0.1%, where we, do, we don't want to make mistakes. So you'll have to do a little bit of overdoing to keep our, our death rates low. And for an infant, we can use uh, fluids like 1 ml IV and 1 ml oral. More than the 1.5, you can use 2 ml. Um, the first sign of leaking on the ultrasound scanning, we should start uh, or in the platelet count is less than 100,000. We, we, we try to give patients fluids only 1.5 ml per kg fluid rate given as 0.5 ml IV and 1 ml oral. And the fluid that we use is uh, mostly uh, normal saline in 5% dextrose or normal saline. Uh, if you're a diabetic, you cannot give uh, dextrose. Infants, we can give either normal saline or Hartman. 
Um, this uh, 1.5 ml is uh, 0.5 ml IV and 1 ml oral. Therefore, uh, the patient is able to drink. Um, but if the patient is thirsty, we can allow the patient to take a little more, something like 2 ml per kg oral uh, for about three uh, hours during a 24-hour period. And when we are uh, when we are uh, when the patient is sleeping in the night, we can uh, reduce the fluid because you are give, you are only giving total IV. We used to give only 1.2 ml per kg per hour from about six uh, from about 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. So this is the classical uh, fluid uh, chart that we have in our guideline. This is the fluid regime that we use that we give everybody the 1.5 flat rate. And whenever there is uh, some uh, parameter uh, changing or needing intervention, we give them a, a fluid bolus, either a half bolus or a full bolus. What is known as a half bolus is to give a fluid at a rate of 10 ml per kg per hour only for half an hour and stop. A full bolus is to give 10 ml per kg uh, per hour for one hour and stop. So that's uh, that's the full that's the difference between half bolus and a full bolus. So this is the the the, the difference between the, the two regimes and uh, the duration of leaking, as I said, the duration uh, can be different in different uh, patients. One of the practical ways of handling giving fluids is that when we give patients fluids, it is good to think a patient is going to leak once, once you have detected leaking, we, we should first think that we, the patient is going to, look, to leak only for 24 hours and try to manage the first 24 hours by using only half of the fluid quota. And then see, look at the parameters to see whether there is evidence of continuing leaking to decide uh, about further uh, fluid towards the 48 hour mark. And Mostly, we decide on the onset of leaking by looking at the, the parameters as well as looking at what we find in the ultrasound. Suppose if you have seen uh, our first ultrasound shows uh, pericholecystic fluid uh, and fluid around gallbladder, we can think that the leaking may be only about six hours ago. And if you see uh, in our first ultrasound some uh, a small amount of uh, say fluid in the pelvis, uh, maybe it is it is the patient has leaked for about 12 hours. We can also see the rapidity at which the patient's uh, fluid is accumulating. With that, we might have to change the timing that we think from when will this, this patient might have started leaking. So that kind of uh, assessment we will have to do. And if you look at, uh, we have to we have to keep. Uh, monitoring the full blood counts and platelet counts also. And in the natural history, when the patient's platelet counts start naturally rising without you giving platelets, that in 99.9% .9 of the instances, you can assume that the patient who is leaking, the leaking is over. So by the time the patient platelets start rising, the, patient, the leaking has ended uh, hours before. So that's improvement of clinical parameters, definite rise in platelet count, uh, are important in deciding whether the patient's uh, leaking period is over or not. You can also go by the fluid levels, but I should just tell you, if you look at the ultrasound for fluid levels, the ultrasound is, uh, you will see the fluid level still uh, going up for a few hours, even after the leaking is over, probably uh, that is fluid accumulating. Uh, so it will not immediately start, uh, the fluid levels will not immediately start going down, but it will start eventually going down when the, uh, in, the, in the ultrasound. So the ultrasound is mostly useful for you to, you to detect leaking and, 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 and the most important thing is monitoring with the other parameters like pulse pressure, urine output, uh, heart rate, and so on. Your urine output, you would like to have a urine output of 1 ml per kg if possible, of about 0.5 to 1 ml per kg. And um, this is the, the main parameters that you, you go by. The heart rate is one of the most important parameters. 
whenever there is tachycardia, we have to find an explanation for the, the heart rate. And um, I recommend that the, the urine output has to be has to be always uh, maintain above 0 0.5, 0 0.75 or above will be the will be the best. Um, and I'll be uh, also telling whether it is safe to give uh, frusimide for patients with uh, urine output uh, within the next uh, half an hour or so. Right. So when the platelet count is in summary. When the platelet count is more than 150,000, you don't have to, you can just give your normal fluid. That's not, not too much, not too less. Main, all what you have to say is to drink amount, to drink sufficient amount of fluids, not to drink a large amount of fluid to maintain normal urine. But one thing that you need to remember is that before you, when you start leaking, it is good if you're not dehydrated by the time that you start leaking. So you are also not fluid overloaded. So it is good that you have a uh, good normal uh, hydration by the time you leak. So that's the advice: drink sufficiently to maintain your uh, maintain your normal urine. Output. From the time the platelet comes come down below about 150,000, 140, 30, you need to start fluid restriction. And the fluids that we use, as I told earlier, are uh, saline, Hartmann's. The only colloid we use in Sri Lanka is dextran 40. And uh, I would say that we are also uh, have experienced uh, certain uh, reactions to dextran when we use a different brand of dextran, also uh, different response. So we, we use the same dextran that was used by Thailand up to date. We managed to get that get the, the, the dextran. And when dextran is not available, you can use 6% starch. But of course, there is a difference between the between the two. So it, I would very much uh, recommend that we try to use the extra instead of starch. If there is bleeding, we will need uh, to give blood. Now, now I'm coming to the, the the important point that I want to introduce. That may, when we give fluid, it is necessary that we calculate fluid that we need to give on a time scale. That is, we cannot be just giving fluid without counting how much you are giving. I told earlier that when you give fluid for for the first 24 hours, that we really need to try and see whether we can give half of M plus 5 the first 24 hours or less than half. So you need to give fluid what is needed to maintain the parameters of pulse pressure of more than more than 30 and the, the heart rate to avoid tachycardia other than what is expected for fever, and the urine output of uh, around 0.75 ml per uh, kg per hour. Um, and for this, the minimum fluid that you can use, you use uh, the fluid, and whatever leftover fluid can be useful later. So try to try not to exceed the fluid quota, keep the pulse pressure above 30, and uh, we need to proactively uh, prevent shock then wait to treat shock. That's that is what I what I uh, say. That so if you have a patient whose uh, pulse pressure is going down below uh, uh, say 25 or so, then you need to intervene. I will. I'm going to tell how much how to decide how to give the fluid. Uh, then if you have a patient whose uh, urine output is low, you probably have to intervene again to either give uh, more fluid or do some other intervention. Or uh, whether to find whether it is safer to give uh, frosimide. Um, if you have tachycardia, see uh, the reason for tachycardia. Maybe the patient is bleeding. You might have to replace blood. Or uh, so you also have to. Uh, in all these instances, you have to also uh, when the patient is is when the parameters are not right. One of the things that you need to do is to immediately do a capillary uh, hematocrit or capillary PCV. That will also help you to decide uh, your next decisions. Now, see, uh, once um, we have, uh, we are giving fluids, when we are checking the fluids, that you need to check the volume that you are given over a time, time scale. That's what I call as box. Keep checking the amount of fluid given over a time scale. This is the formula. That is fluid given from the onset of leaking divided by the total fluid quota. So that is if it is a 24 hours, uh, 
if you are given uh, half the fluid, that is, uh, say, sort of an adult whose fluid quota is 4,800. If you are given 2,400 uh, uh, fluid, that is, uh, that is giving half the fluid quota for, the, for that time. And then you divide it by the time span from the onset of leaking divided by, divided by 48 hours. Because the fluid is calculated to 48 hours, this is, this is what it is. When you do that, you will get a figure that is whether you have used 100% of the fluid quota or less than 100% of the fluid quota on a time scale. So if you use 2,400 uh, patients whom, uh, who the uh, fluid quota is 4,000, uh, if your fluid quota is 4,000, if you use 2,000 ml over 24 hours, you have used 100% of the fluid quota on a time scale. Your watts will be 100. And we just uh, looked at how much fluid does a, does a classical, typical uh, DHA patient needs in a study, which I'm not going to give, give, give many, many details about, but I'll, I'll slowly tell that in, a, in, in, a pay, in, in 2017, from 2017 January, we just looked at consecutive 400 DHF patients admitted to our center and looked at uh, they apply them the fluid regime that we are, we are giving them. Uh, some of them came, uh, came, no, all of them did not come to us at the beginning of leaking. They were admitted from the wards. Some of them had, have had different fluid regimes uh, in the wards as well as from outside. So, uh, but from the time that were, they were admitted, we switched them back to our fluid regime after resuscitating. And then uh, we did uh, the, the leaking scans and took uh, the data from them to look at the amount of fluids that we gave. We found that out of the patients, 83.8% of patients needed less than 85% of the fluid quota that is, uh, that is recommended for, for the, from the, the, the standard fluid quota that we, we got from uh, Bangkok. So 83.8% or 335 out of 400 could be managed for the entire critical phase by using only 85, less than 85% uh, of the fluid quota. And, um, and out of the, them, the, they needed, when they needed the flat rate of 1.5 ml, when they needed some fluid boluses in between. We looked at uh, what is the fluid bolus that the patient need, and uh, we found that 63.7% of patients, almost two thirds, could, from beginning to end, they could end the entire leaking period with uh, just uh, 1.5 ml without needing even a fluid bolus, half bolus or, or full bolus, and maintain their parameters, urine out of everything, at just 1.5 ml. That's a large number. 255 out of 400 patients could end while having leaking, while having bilateral pleural effusions, while having uh, leaking into the pelvis, where ultrasound has confirmed there is progressive leaking. They could end leaking from beginning to end at 1.5 ml without needing any intermittent uh, crystalloid or polite boluses. One third needed boluses. And then we, we looked at uh, what, what are the, 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 the boluses that we need. 12% needed just one, 12% uh, of those patients, that is uh, out, of the, out of the 145 patients who needed fluids, uh, just 48, 48 patients needed only one uh, additional crystalloid bolus. And 75.7% uh, of the patients, that almost three fourths, needed the constant uh, fluid rate or constant fluid rate plus a single additional dose of single additional single bolus, which is most of these boluses, so half boluses of giving just 10 ml for half an hour. So that's the only only thing. Or um, I'll tell more about it. 
So only a single colloy bolus was uh, needed by 3.3% uh, of the patients. That is, they needed only one single colloid bolus um, in addition to the, the flat rate of fluid. And then there was just 10%, 40 out of the, the 145 patients needing adequate needed multiple boluses of crystalloids and colloids. So that's that's what it is. That is what, uh, this is our guideline. This means that uh, uh, they needed, all the DHF patients could complete the leaking phase without needing the ascending and descending rates of fluid described in our actual guideline and revised and expanded in 2012. The usual fluid regime, the stepwise one was not needed. We, we were able to, to complete it. So none of these patients were given fluids in ascending and descending, which means uh, that uh, all DHF patients could complete their entire leaking phase at a background fat rate of 1.5 ml plus, uh, and few needed occasional intermittent boluses. Nearly two thirds needing only the only the only the only the fat rate. Uh, now, of the patients who needed boluses, they either needed boluses because they had a pulse uh, pressure less than 30, either they had unexplained uh, tachycardia or they had uh, urine output of less than 0.5, uh, they had rising uh, axial volume or shock. Of course, shock, not because they were on this regime. They were, these are the shock patients or patients who were admitted from elsewhere. Uh, after they resuscitated, none of these patients had re shock and impending, or uh, patients who had impending shock, uh, who, who had uh, pulse pressures between 20 and 30. In that of those groups, there are some patients who were who were with us from the 1.5 regime, but all the patients who, who came to us with shock were not on this fluid regime by the time we had the first, uh, had the first shock. So these are the, the, the fluids that we used and, uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the crystallized boluses that they have. Um, these are the number of dextra and boluses that were given. 80.5% uh, of patients, that 302 did not require any colloid. And dextra and 40 was the only colloid that we used. So 80% of the patients did not need any colloid. And the types of dextra and um, boluses, only four patients needed full dextra and bolus of 10 ml per kg given over 60 minutes mentioned in the national guideline. Most dextra and boluses were half boluses, that is we have to give half, multiple half boluses, 5 ml per kg given over 30, um, 30 minutes, that, that is at a rate of 10 ml per kg. So during uh, leaking, all were uh, started on 1.5 ml per hour of fluid rate and uh, 0.5 ml IV and 1 ml oral. So this is uh, this is the, the the conclusion. We had a zero fatality rate for these 400 patients, and they were safely discharged home. And the, that suggests that the current national guideline for dengue need review and revision based on the insights clinicians have after years of experience in managing a large number of patients. And uh, so this this is now I'm coming to coming to the application of words. Uh, this is the, the last uh, 15 minutes, try to concentrate. Now, when we get a patient who's whom we are managing, that I, I told that the important thing is to keep the pulse pressure below uh, above 30 all the time. If the pulse pressure is 25 in this patient, what should you do? You have to immediately, any, any situation that you need to calculate the watts and see. If the watts is less than 70%, you can easily, we safely give a colloid. You can give a, uh, and if it is less than 60%, you have to give a, you should consider giving a full bolus of crystal. That is full one, 10 ml per kg over one hour. And if it is between, when you give the, give this bolus, the watts will change. So when, if the watts is between 60 to 80%, a half bolus of crystal may be enough in most patients. Once you give, you can see what happens to the parameters, check the, the hematocrit and decide whether you need another bolus. When the watts is more than 80%, that is you have given more than 80%, so now you have to, you are already, you are close to uh, coming into the top of your fluid quota. Therefore, you can give a, a, a fluid that will remain in circulation for a longer period, like dextran 40. So giving dextran 40 is justified if your watts is above 
about uh, 80. If your watch is above 90%, I will give a colloid, but remember, when you give the colloid, it will reach 100%. Therefore, I will give a very small dose of lucimide along with, the, with it to a patient whose pulse pressure is low, whose watch is more than 90%. If watch is more than 100%, definitely this patient is fluid overloaded. Therefore, this patient will need uh, a colloid along with frosimide. Now, though this patient is in the leaking phase, we need to give, we need to give, you, you may not have exceeded the entire fluid quota, but on a time scale, if you have exceeded over 100%, you have to give a colloid with frosimide. This is an example. How many hours of uh, what to do, depending on the fluid that we give. We need to ask how many hours of leaking so far. If it is uh, the total fluid quota is 4,000, and at 24 hours, if the pulse pressure is 25, if only 1,200 ml is given, that is you are given only 60%, you will need saline. If you are given 1,900, that is you are given 95% on a time scale, or your watch is 95%, you should not give any say, more saline to this patient. You will have to give a colloid. If you are given 2,200 ml, that is your watch is 110% on a time scale. This patient's pulse pressure is low, therefore you will have to give a colloid, but not alone, you have to give a colloid and frosimide. And what about the low urine output? If you have a patient whose urine output is less than, uh, urine output is low, and if your watch is less than 70%, you have to give a, give a crystalloid. If your watch is less than 60%, you can give considering you know, full bolus because this patient hasn't got enough enough fluid to pass urine. If it's less, between 60 to 80%, you can give a half bolus of crystalloid. That's enough. If it is more than 80, now remember the patient's other parameters are okay. The patient is only having low urine output. Therefore, you can do, you can give this patient a small dose of frosimide. This is the most important message that I want to give you today. If you want only one message. This is the commonest cause of fluid of uh, commonest cause of fluid overload, giving more fluid to people who have low urine output despite all the other parameters being normal. You need to give a test dose of uh, frosimide, which I say is between 0.05 to 0.1 milligrams per kilogram body weight. Then most patients will start pass urine. If your watch is more than 90%. You, def you can give a small dose of frosimide, little more, maybe 0.1 or 0.5 milligrams per kg. If the watch is more than 100% uh, and the patient, all of the parameters are okay, but the patient is not passing urine, you can give between 0.1 to 0.5 milligrams per kg of uh, frosimide. So again, the same thing. Uh, if you're given, you look at what happened, if you're given only 1,200 ml to this patient whose fluid quota is 4,000, you have to give saline. If you're given 1,900 ml, you have to give uh, a, a small dose of frosimide. And if you're given 2,200 ml, all the other parameters are okay, you will have to give a little larger dose of uh, frosimide. If there is, if there is a, if the problem is tachycardia, you will have to think of hypokalemia, hypo hypocalcemia, and bleeding. Uh, first, you will have to manage this uh, is, uh, as for low pulse pressure, that you will have to probably resuscitate the patient who is having tachycardia by giving a colloid and then, then look for evidence of leaking. Um, so if a DHF patient is coming in shock, what are the possibilities and how to give fluids? Remember, if when a if a patient is dehydrated by the time he started leaking, few hours into leaking, at the, at the point of A, he can go into shock. You can give a little fluid to correct the shock and get the pulse back, pulse pressure back to 30, and you can continue the 1.5 ml. He might not go into, go into shock again. You should not just think that this patient has already leaked for 24 hours. The classical one and the middle is the one that is leaking for 24 hours. Then the patient might naturally leak and maybe drink water, be at home, and uh, or come late. He's, he's, uh, he has not taken enough fluid, but anyway, he compensated. And towards the very end of his leaking, he might go into shock because the fluid is inadequate. 
this patient will not need another 24 hours of large amount of fluid because this is the time is leaking is over the fluid is going to be reabsorbed and it is dangerous to give this patient a large amount of amount of uh, fluid this because this patient will again go into heart failure if you do that so coming in shock a dehydrated patient yeah, either a mild early leaking a, a patient who has severe rapid leaking or a classical dhf or a slow leaker who has not received enough fluid the first thing you need to do is to resuscitate to give 20 ml per kg bolus as fast as possible while feeling for pulse until the pulse is well felt. Once the pulse is very well felt and the pulse pressure goes above 30, do get a PCV done and send the fluid for the next one hour at a rate of 10 ml per kg per hour. Continue that for one hour and repeat the hematocrit. And that will tell you the story about the rate of leaking and the degree of hydration. If needed to switch to dextran, it is best you do it after giving 20 ml per kg of saline. You should not give dehydrated patients dextran. I would think that you should at least give 10 ml per kg of normal saline before resuscitating. And uh, this is one of the, the, the classical examples of a patient who has come with cold extremities and shock. But when this patient was given fluid without counting, that you kept on giving at 18 hours, you're given 110% given of, the, of the fluid quota. That is, you already finished your fluid quota in 18 hours. That's the importance of counting the fluid. And this patient died uh, because by, by 18 hours, his watts was 266% that he got so much of fluid. Um, fluid. He finished his his, his uh, fluid coding box was calculated. This this death could have been avoided, and uh, the patients had cardiac arrest at 39 hours when the watch was 257. So that's that is uh, that's the lesson, and uh, always it is good to give control fluid than giving adequate fluid. When you give more fluid, you will have more leak. And uh, if you can't believe, if you don't like to go down to 1.5 ml, don't give 2 to 3 ml as a result of listening to me. You should switch from 5 ml to 3 ml, it will not do me any good because better to continue your usual 4 ml, 5 ml, 7 ml if you don't want to come back to 1.5 ml. At 2 to 3 ml, the leaking is increased, but there is no enough fluid to compensate. So this is what I what I found that if you give at 1.5 ml, there is less leaking and there is no fluid overload. If you give 2 to 3.5 ml, there is fluid overload and prolongation of both because the fluid is inadequate. If you give more than 4 ml, you will get fluid overload, but not uh, probably probably uh, prolonged shock easily. But towards the end, when the you are entirely filled with fluid, you will get shock also. Um, also remember. The clinical improvement, heart rate, slowing or urine output, increase in pulse pressure widening. When you are, those things are there. When your PCV is still high, you don't have to do anything to, uh, to bring it down until, because until the fluid start returning, the, the PCV might not go down. And if you're in a fluid overloaded patient, tachycardia and narrow pulse pressure can occur. Uh, when the leaking stop and fluid start coming. So sometimes you might have to give a small dose of flucimide in response to that, especially if your watch is high. So each patient can be managed in many different ways and with different rates of uh, and choice of IV fluids, but try to master the ways to take these patients smoothly and in an uneventful manner towards uh, recovery. The aim is to avoid both shock and uh, fluid overload we know that there are new virulent viruses, genetic ethnic factors, but remember that this is changed by the way we manage it. Remember any day, any fever during in a during a, uh, in a dengue endemic case, there could be dengue, and we need to do serological diagnosis to find to diagnose dengue. Serial ultrasound for diagnosing leaking is the best way. Bedside microhematocrit is needed for monitor leaking. You need to keep the pulse pressure above 30. Maintain a urine output of 0.5 to 1 ml. Not uh, when it is, you have to intervene when the urine output is above, not uh, below 0.5 ml. 
Keep counting the fluid while managing DHF to avoid prolonged shock and fluid overload. Remember your words. When consecutive platelet counts are naturally rising, leaking is over irrespective of the time of the onset of leaking. Just because the leaking is only 12 hours, 18 hours, when the fluid platelets are rising, you need to, to, to think that the patient's leaking may be over. Uh, leaking can occur as early as uh, day two or as late as day seven. Leaking may be as short as six hours or as long as 48 hours. Thank you.